Cool. So thanks, Asim. Um, as he has, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Brian O'Connor. I've been with the ONF uh, for a little while now. Uh, came from the ON Lab side of things um, and have been kind of more involved in the controller side, um, SDN platform side, and uh, have, this is kind of a foray into the embedded system side. Um, so if you've been to any ONF talks over the last, like, I don't know, 10 or so years, you've probably seen a picture that looks a lot like this. This is the canonical SDN architecture. Um, you've got some really simple packet forwarding devices at the bottom of your network. You've got a really nice uh, interface to a logically centralized network OS. And then you've got a whole bunch of uh, SDN applications that add value and service and control plane uh, to your network. Um, it's a really nice separation. Uh, picture sounds really good. Um, but if I pull the room today, show of hands, whose network looks like this? I thought I'd get like at least one or two hands. I guess no one from Google's here. Um, I'll show you another slide, this slide. Um, so in this slide, you've got a forwarding chip, um, you've got an embedded network OS, and then you've got a whole bunch of pr uh, protocols on there, probably BGP, spanning tree, OSPF, pretty much every RFC that we've written since 1970. So whose network looks more like this? Yeah, so the question is, if your network looks like this, and you want to go to a network that looks like this, how do we make that transformation happen? And um, before we go there, I'll just mention maybe some, some, some like specifics, like some of the reasons that you may be, be thinking about why this is hard. So first is insufficient or missing interfaces. Um, and this is not just about open flow and control, right? It's about configuration, monitoring, telemetry, operations. You've got to have a rich set of interfaces and not just like any set of interfaces, you know, not just talking about SNMP and NetConf and maybe like my CLI works, um, but like a rich set, set of uh, interfaces that are well-defined and high performance. That's like what you need as a base to make this happen. Uh, I mentioned this, lack of easy incremental migration path. Like you've got a picture on one side that looks radically different than the picture on the other side and how do you start to think about moving that forward? Um, and finally, a maturity and availability of solutions at all layers of the stack. So uh, it may work well for a demo, but how do I really get this into my network, running in production, um, and, and meeting sort of the, the service level availability that, that I've promised to my customers? So for us, it starts with interfaces. Um, and what you have today is you've got um, OpenFlow for some degree of pipeline control. It's fairly fixed function, it defines the header fields that are usable and acceptable, um, but, but doesn't really go much beyond that unless you're willing to extend the protocol. Uh, from a pipeline definition perspective, there's no formal standard. Uh, there's some people that have gone down the uh, route of defining some TTPs, specific table type patterns uh, that are implemented across a subset of devices. Uh, there are some industry-wide industry initiatives like SI to try to standardize the interface uh, for the pipeline from a, a definition perspective, but, but there's not really anything we have today. Uh, for configuration, there's not really a standard. Uh, as I mentioned before, SNMP exists, NetConf exists. A lot of people are still using CLI to control device. Um, I'll SSH into the box programmatically, type in my password, and, and, and we're off. And then on the operational front, uh, the ability to do firmware updates, the ability to push certificates, the ability to um, do basic bit error rate testing or ping testing. Like, there's not really a good uh, uh, compute, or sorry, API-centric approach to being able to do that. It's, it's primarily like a geared for, for people typing at it. And so what we've done is we've tried to address each of these, these categories of interfaces. Um, the first is we've adopted uh, P4 as the language for defining your pipeline. So whether you've got a fixed function pipeline like we've got at the bottom, your vendor gives you a pipeline, whether you want to logically abstract that pipeline by providing a subset of the pipeline, or whether you're, you're working with a new programmable chip where you get to define the pipeline, we're using P4 as a universal language uh, for defining what the actual forwarding pipeline looks like and the data plane protocols that are in play. On the pipeline control side, uh, we're adopting P4 runtime a protocol that's based on gRPC out of the P4 runtime or P4 consor language consortium. Um, this is a program independent, protocol independent, uh, data plane independent protocol that enables you to manipulate the entities that are defined by the P4 program. So things like uh, getting packets, reading and writing uh, flow rule updates, 
uh, doing um, updates to registers, looking at counters. Uh, all those types of things can be done over P4 runtime. When you add new data planes or change your pipeline, this protocol stays the same. And what changes is the contract that's uh, been defined by your P4 program. On the configuration side, uh, we're adopting a subset of the open config models around like interfaces, QoS, VLANs, uh, things that are not necessarily the control plane models, but more the platform related models. Uh, and we're using a protocol out of the open config working group called GNMI. This is another gRPC based service, uh, which supports uh, not just uh, the ability to set and get config, but also the ability to stream updates from the data plane up to the control plane, uh, listen for alarms, and get some uh, telemetry information from devices. And then in the operation side, we're using a suite of protocols uh, called under the, the umbrella of GNOI, uh, Network Operation Interfaces. Uh, this is for things like I mentioned before, rebooting device, pushing new firmware to device, um, adding certificates, doing basic testing, the ephemeral types of things that you need to be able to do when you're uh, actually putting a box into production and things are, need to be set up or, or to get them working. So what is Stratum? Well, Stratum is taking these as our northbound interfaces, the standard externally facing interfaces, and it's providing an open source, lightweight, production ready implementation of those interfaces on top of white box hardware. So let me talk a little bit about how Stratum can be used to migrate your network. So if your picture looks like this today, um, which most of you said it does, uh, the first step is to upgrade your network OS to a Stratum powered device. This allows you to maintain the same operational model, the same management model that you've been doing on your network uh, today. Um, this may sound more challenging than it is. Uh, this morning I just gave a talk in the, the Linux uh, networking dev forum on how Stratum can be integrated with platforms like Danos, um, platforms like uh, OpenSwitch, Psy, and, and a few other uh, network OSs. So this actually uh, sits in very well at the um, hardware abstraction layer for most uh, network OSs that are either open source or available from vendors today. So Stratum will be working on um, integrating uh, as a layer to existing network OSs to help uh, both give them flexibility to use new types of hardware and, and expand their capabilities of, of hardware, um, but also, as you'll see, to enable some remote control as well. So with Stratum, you can layer uh, SDN network OS on top of your embedded OS. It uses the same set of interfaces for both local and remote control. And what you can start to do is add the SDN services that we've been talking about uh, for years in, into how to add value to your network. So you can do, start to do traffic engineering from a global perspective while still maintaining a BGP or DHCP server or spanning tree on, on the box just to keep your network up and running. Uh, you can add monitoring or troubleshooting so that you can do alarm correlation between various, uh, various components or start to see where bottlenecks or um, extra capacities available in your network and that can kind of feed into traffic engineering. Once you've got that done and you've got some experience using your network OS in production uh, in this hybrid model, what you can start to do is you can start to migrate existing services from the uh, embedded OSs to your centralized OS. So let's say DHCP uh, is not something you really need to be running on your boxes. You could take that, shut it down on the embedded OS, and spin up DHCP on your network OS. Here I showed it all happening at once. It doesn't have to happen at once. You can move these functions um, kind of however you want. You can move it from one box at a time. You can move it across your whole network at a time. Eventually, you can migrate the functions that make sense to the logically centralized control plane. And eventually, if you go down the, the full path to SDN, you can probably even remove the embedded OS uh, on the box. This obviously becomes a deployment decision that you get to make as an operator now. And you can decide whether for some parts of your network it makes sense to have an embedded OS and a full suite of routing applications or it makes sense to have something a bit more lightweight. The other thing I'll mention is um, OpenFlow. So I'm, I'm running a network today. Let's, I didn't get any show of hands here, but had there been a hand. I'm running an OpenFlow network. It's great. I wrote a whole bunch of applications. Um, I bought into the SDN thing. Like, are you leaving me behind? No, the answer is no. Um, and if you're using a network OS, like, um, oh, what happened here? I think we froze. All right. 
So if you're using a network OS like Onos, there are a number of abstractions that we provide that'll help make this migration really easy. In Onos, OpenFlow is just a southbound, and we have a number of abstractions in the core, like flow objectives, uh, a dynamic configuration subsystem that's independent of the actual control protocol, and a notion of behaviors uh, that abstract certain uh, capabilities for particular devices. And the applications that you write in Onos are on top of those abstractions. In a world with Stratum, you add the Stratum southbound protocol support, and then you can seamlessly migrate devices off of OpenFlow into Stratum. You could basically take the device down, push a Stratum enabled OS to it, and then have it reconnect to a platform like Onos and run the same control apps um, from one to the other. This also applies to things like um, dynamically programmable devices. And so if you've got a standard fixed function chip in your network, uh, you can add a new device, use the same P4, same P4 program that you used to define uh, your pipeline in the old model, bring up your new device with the same P4 program, and then it'll seamlessly work. Uh, then, as it makes sense, you can kind of evolve that P4 program, adding functionality as it makes sense to offload VNFs or add new uh, types of control protocols. Uh, the last thing I'll touch on is production readiness. So Stratum uh, is a project that's seeded by the production code from Google. If you were at OCP last week, um, Google did a demo um, using uh, Stratum on top of their uh, production uh, environment on top of uh, an undisclosed switch. And so this, this story uh, that we're telling is, is, not to, is, is just to say that you know, we're not starting from scratch here. We're starting from a, a, a seed code base on a network that's probably one of the largest uh, pure SDN networks uh, in production today. And this complements kind of the story that you're hearing from the rest of the ONF. Like just uh, last week, uh, AT&T announced that uh, there's gonna be a collaboration with um, ONF to, to deploy Volta uh, on top of their next gen uh, PON network. And so you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, field trials, deployments, and you just heard from, from the operators just like half an hour ago about how they're committed to putting these platforms into production. And Stratum's just another pr uh, project that's gonna fit uh, right into that, that story. We've got a great set of partners. As I mentioned, Google's uh, one of the big cloud providers. There's a number of telecom uh, partners that have, have already joined the project as a member. Um, from a white box ODM side, we've got uh, Delta, Edgecore, QCT, uh, a whole bunch of silicon vendors that have, have committed to uh, providing implementations uh, that map the uh, Stratum APIs down to their um, individual um, chip SDKs, and then a number of open source projects we're collaborating with as well. I'll briefly touch on the timeline, because this is kind of the, the new kid on the block. Uh, two weeks ago, we launched the community. Uh, we expect the seed code will be available for the pioneering members of the project at the end of this month. Uh, there's gonna be a number of work days and development efforts uh, made on an open source reference platform. Um, as well as some of the infrastructure required to extract uh, the code from, from their production environment. Um, that'll happen over the next uh, about three months. We've got a six month period uh, where the code base will be generally available to members of the project. Uh, we hope to build uh, support for all the, the, the vendors uh, that I mentioned before, have additional feature development, some hackathons along the way. Towards the end of the year, we expect uh, field trials and production deployments on some of the cloud and telco partners. Uh, that, that I, I showed on the previous slide. And this all culminates in an open source launch around the end of the year. Um, at that point, the community kicks in and we, uh, we start the, the fully open source uh, community development effort uh, on top of the platforms uh, from the, the member partners. So just to summarize, um, Stratum's uh, both an implementation and a set of interfaces. Uh, the interfaces around control, config, monitoring, telemetry, it's got a minimal design for high performance. Same interfaces, whether you're local or remote. Um, we've, we're really uh, focused on enable, enabling incremental migration paths so that you can incrementally have value add for the, the features you do wanna add. You don't have to transform your network before you can start to realize benefit. We've got broad uh, support from the, the switching chip vendor and platform community, and they've committed to, to putting this on their platform. And this is, you know, rooted in a, a production-ready implementation. We're not, we're not necessarily starting from scratch. There's more information on stratumproject.org, and if you're interested in hearing more announcements, uh, there's an announced mailing list you can, you can sign up for. So, that's it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we 
are going to have only one or two questions because we are running short of time. But I see one hand up already. So Brian, stay on. And please, uh, uh, Thomas, please can you go up and set up for the next one? Hi, I have questions. I saw that you know, Stratum is a strong associator with the P4s, right? Right now, it's a, how many silicon wonder you know, the, has product, uh, has the, you know, chips to support uh, P4 natively. I, I saw the, you know, the uh, barefoots, no other you know, the chip wonder is support that. But that's very important, is, right? If you ask the you know, service provider to migrate to that platform, if you know, it's a forwarding plan, it's a performance reduce you know, 30% or 20%, is a, I'm not sure what do we think, yeah. No, it's a, it's a great question, and I think what I'll, I want to do is just clarify that the, um, because we're using P4 doesn't necessarily mean the chip has to be programmable. The box that Google did their production demo on is not a barefoot chip. It's not a, it's not a uh, programmable chip. It's actually a chip that is probably in a lot of your networks today. The performance, the, the performance degradation is, is, is not necessarily related to uh, the P4 abstraction. So what happens is we haven't measured the P4 runtime versus like native SDK. That's part of the, the, the project that we, we, like to, we like to do. But basically, if you use P4 as a, a, a way to model the pipeline you already have, and then offline, you have a compiler generate the bindings from the P4 table abstractions to the SDK calls that need to happen. The runtime is really just a matter of I get a P4 call, I look up the mapping, and I make the call down. And that's all happening in the same user space process, like in the same C program. So we're talking about method calls with maybe one or two levels of indirection while you look at like a hash table to see how to map the P4 table name to the underlying switch uh, SDK. OK. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, from a data plane perspective, uh, once the rules are pushed down to the switch SDK, there's no, there's no difference. Hans Jörg has a comment, maybe? Thank you. I, I should, Hans Jörg from Deutsche Telekom. I should probably know that. But um, what I never understood is, it, will that the, the end result towards end of the year, will that be bundled with a complete OS? So that you integrate it with open network Linux that I can just download it and install it on any white box I have, or do you see Stratum as a plugin that I can add to my uh, version of open network Linux that I'm running in my network? Uh, both. So uh, the question is: Is Stratum a full network OS that I just download an image and get going, or can I add it as a plugin? Uh, Stratum runs um, in user space uh, using the. SDKs that are provided from kernel drivers. So you can either take the open network Linux image that we're going to provide as part of the project, or you can take the binary and add it to an existing Debian based kernel. Um, pretty much like Debian, ONL, a lot of other flavors, Ubuntu, um, will accept uh, Stratum. And it's fairly minimal from a de dependency perspective. Uh, basically, the, the biggest dependency is do you have the uh, SDKs and platform drivers uh, for the peripherals available to your um, to the to the to the agent, and then from there, uh, it's kind of up to you how you choose to deploy it. Okay, we'll have to stop there.